take your Bibles and turn to the book of Jonah. We're going to be preaching through the book of Jonah for the next several weeks. And uh, we're going to be talking about just another fishing story. Just another fishing story. Um, how many of you like to fish? Anybody like to fish? Yeah, some people don't like to fish. Like quite a few people like to I like to eat fish too. Anybody else? Anybody like to eat fish? Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, I guess it may depend on what kind of fish you're talking about. I like to eat all kinds of fish. Uh, it's good for you too, but probably not so good when you put batter on it and fry it and all that kind of stuff. It's not as good for you. So Jonah chapter 1 is where we're going to be today. Jonah chapter 1. And uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting series for me. I, I, I love to talk about uh, the Word of God. And I like to talk about the, the uh, stories of Old Testament that we heard when we were coming to Vacation Bible School and, and learning growing up. And Jonah and the, the whale is one of those stories. Uh, so today we begin this new series again in the book of Jonah. Uh, again, most of it's familiar to us. Uh, you know, Jonah and how he was swallowed by a whale or a big fish. You know, there's uh, some people kind of argue over the fact, was it a whale? Was it a big fish? Well, I don't know. It was a whale of a fish, okay? Uh, the book of Jonah is more uh, than the story of Jonah and the big fish. So we want, we're going to hit some highlights of things, not just to talk about Jonah and the whale or the big fish. We're going to be talking about some different things. I mean, some of the things we find is, God is God in his sovereign power at work in this story. Uh, we find his grace revealed and given to Jonah and also his grace revealed and given to a rebellious and sinful city or nation. Some questions that we're going to answer in this book or in the, through the book of Jonah uh, are some of these. Now listen to this and see if this doesn't really uh, kind of meet us where we are today in our culture and where we are today in America. Uh, first thing is, First question that we're going we're gonna to answer throughout this study is, who is deserving of God's grace and mercy? That's a question. Who is deserving of God's grace and mercy? You know, if you haven't noticed, we live in what, what is being called now cancel culture. Anybody heard of that cancel culture? Uh, you know, basically everybody's, anything in the past is being canceled. We're tearing down uh, statues of people like uh, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and, and people that have made a difference in our, in our history. Uh, you know, are we proud of all of our history? No, we haven't been perfect. This nation has not been perfect. It has not been perfect. And there are things that we uh, would, would, you know, hope that we would not repeat. I mean, we don't want history to repeat itself. So one of the questions we're going to talk about is who is deserving of God's grace and mercy? And then another question, who decides who receives it? Who gets God's grace and mercy? Who, who, gets to, who is the one who receives that? Who decides who gets to receive God's grace and mercy? What about this one? What, what should be my response to God's extended grace to others, even others I feel who don't deserve it? You know, sometimes we think about life and we think about the world around us, and there's probably people, honestly, that if we're dishonest and we're, you know, we want to be honest. If we're honest, we'd have to say that there's probably people uh, that, we, that we have either read about, been on the news, or maybe even people that we know who we think, you know what, uh, that person has been so bad, they've been so awful, they've done so many things that they probably don't even deserve God's grace or mercy. What about this one? Does God give second chances if we blow it? I don't know about you, that, that's real to me. Because you know how many times I blow it? Quite often, okay? You know, what about to, to, what extent, to what extent is God willing to go to involve me in his work? In other words, you know, how hard is God going to work to help me to be involved with him and joining him in his work? Here's another one that is right where we are today. Is there hope? Is there hope for a nation that is so sinful, God's judgment is about to come down on it. Now, I don't know about you. That's a real question for America today. We're not talking about America in this passage. We're talking about Nineveh. But I think there's some parallels there that we can, th we can talk about and think about, okay? And then this one, does repentance make a difference? Does repentance make a difference? What is repentance? Well, we're, we're agreeing with God about our sin, and then we're turning away from that sin, and we're turning towards God. 
does repentance matter? Does it, does it matter today if I, if I am sorry and if I want to agree with God and want to turn away from that and go? It, does that make a difference? Can it cause God to change uh, his mind as far as judgment goes? So let's go and let's, let's turn over to the book of Jonah chapter 1 and let's, let's begin uh, going to this first uh, message today. Jonah chapter 1. We're going to be dealing with the first five or six verses here. So Jonah chapter 1, when you get there, stand to your feet as we read from God's Word. Jonah chapter 1, beginning verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. Amen. That's all right. I like all kind of amens. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it for their wickedness. Notice this. For their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down in the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. Notice verse 6. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for our time together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, God, that you would be glorified and magnified and made big in the next few moments. And, God, that as, as that happens... Lord, may your Holy Spirit just work in our hearts. May we be challenged and changed for your glory. And God, may we leave here different than we came in. Uh, Lord, we just love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Be seated. So we're going to title the first, remember our, our study, our, our um, series is this title, Just Another Fishing Story. Everybody say fishing. Everybody say story. Okay, some of you are awake. Some of you are still struggling, all right? Like, like my grandson this morning who didn't want to get up. Just another fishing story. And today, the first message under this, this uh, series is called Sleeping. Everybody say sleeping. Sleeping on the job. Sleeping on the job. Listen, I, a few years ago, I, I was employed at Fafner, just right, right over, not very far from here. Um, and I was uh, hired in there as a picker packer, a picker packer. I uh, worked in shipping, okay? Um, so uh, one of my jobs as being a picker packer was is we had these order pickers. It was a machine that you, uh, you, you went down the aisles, and when you got on the aisle, there was a little electronic eye or something, and when you got it locked on there, you could, all you had to do was just kind of give it the gas, and it would go back and forth, and you could raise it up and down, way up in there to get the, the, you know, the items that you needed to pack and all this kind of stuff and everything. So anyway... Uh, I did that for several months, and why, but why, after I, you know, after several several months, I went out into the plant. And I worked at other parts of the factory and that kind of stuff. But I didn't remember there was a there was a young man who worked third shift uh, in in shipping, and uh, one night he was running his order picker back and forth, uh, and he fell asleep on the job, and he felt and you know it wasn't bad. It was bad enough that he fell asleep, but he also ran out the end of the building. I mean, he drove all the way through the, through the, um, the fence and stuff that was there. And I mean, he, drove, he run the order picker into the building, into the end of the building. And sad to say that about six months later, he did the same thing again. And uh, unfortunately, you know, the fellow lost his job. He wasn't working there anymore, which is probably, you know, I guess the right, that was the right thing to do. Um, you know, he'd already got mercy and grace for one time. Two times was too many. But he, he fell asleep on the job. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder, and when it comes to spirituality and God's business right now, 
uh, you know, and the church. We're talking about the church. Everybody say church. We're talking about the church, okay? Those who are born-again believers, those who know Jesus Christ. I wonder sometimes if we are not guilty of sometimes being asleep on the job. You know, we're, we're not engaged as much as we should. We should be. Um, you know, we hear all this stuff about cancel culture, and, and I, I was listening to the, to the um, Christian radio yesterday, um, and it was talking about um, the election. And I'm not, I'm not here to preach politics or anything. I just want you to listen. Um, but it's talking about the election about, and about uh, after, before that happened, there were several uh, people who, who call themselves and, and who are, you know, known by the, um, I guess, the charismatic world as being prophets or prophets of today. And many of the, like 40 or 50 of these people had predicted that uh, the president, President Trump, was going to win the second term. He was going to spend, he was going to spend two consecutive terms in the White House and all these things and how everything was going to go and all of this kind of stuff and everything. And the problem is, is that did not happen. And this whole show, this, this, uh, this um, talk show, it was a religious show, was talking about how many of these, uh, quote, prophets um, continue to uh, put forth this false narrative. See, the problem with that is the same thing that happened with the, with the, um, all the Mormons and Joseph Smith. And as he started this, see, he would say that Jesus was going to come back such and such day to a such and such place. Well, when Jesus didn't come back such and such day to such and such place, he would change, well, I, you know, I, you know, this is what this has changed. God's given me a new revelation, so this is what it is. So we got to be careful, and we're going to talk about this as we get in the message. We got to be careful, and, and and you know this this culture in which we live in, folks. We got to be careful who we're listening to. We got to be careful where we get our information from. We got to be careful just because somebody calls himself a prophet of God. I mean, listen. I would, never, I would not want to ever say that I was a prophet of God because you know, what the, you know what happens if you're a prophet of God? You've got to be right 100% of the time. You never can be wrong. You can't say today, this is what God says and this is the, thus says the word of the Lord. This is what God says today and, and you get it right today and then tomorrow you give another something that God has given you and something be totally wrong, then the Bible says you're a false prophet and you're not of God. So... In this story, we're going to find out that Jonah is a, he is a prophet. He is a man that God chooses uh, to give out his message. And in this particular story, uh, Jonah has been called of God. Well, let's just talk about it. Let's look at it from our outline here. Uh, first point under sleeping on the job, we, the first point is a prophet in verses 1 and 2. A prophet. Everybody say prophet. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 18 uh, hold your Bible in Jonah and go to Deuteronomy chapter 18 because this is important. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now God has given out the law and, and here in Deuteronomy chapter 18 um, it's talking about a new prophet like Moses. And look down at verse chapter 18, verse number, well, let's just go to verse 17. Down to verse 22. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. And they're talking about wanting a prophet. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So the, the role of the prophet is, is to speak all that God tells him to say nothing more nothing less he's to give God's message to the people verse 19 it says and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words through the prophet which he speaks in my name I will require it of him in other words they'll be judged uh, if they'll not receive those words look at verse 20 but the prophet who presumes to speak a name a word in my name the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name. In other words, you're, a person stands up and says, listen, I've got a word from God. This is what God says. Thus says God, the Lord, about this. Or who speaks in the name of other gods. But the, Let me go back and start again. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. 
And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? How do we know if God spoke to him or not? Well, listen to what it says. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. So basically what I, what I mean by that, I want us to understand that just because, you know, just because somebody says, I, I got a word from God doesn't mean they have a word from God. Now, I'm not saying that there's not people who, who doesn't have a word from God. I'm just telling you that we need to be careful. You know, like I said, these 40 or 50 folks, men and women, both, who call themselves modern-day prophets, who said all these things about the election, all this stuff was going to happen, they're, they're refusing to repent and say, you know what, I, I misunderstood. I was not, there's maybe a few that's saying that, but not many of them. They just continue to change the narrative. So to me, they're no different. Matter of fact, they're worse than those folks who, who are, you know, continuing to just, you know, spew all this hate and all this stuff that's going on, this cancel culture in which we live in. Anyway, that's another message for another day. So we're talking about a prophet. Everybody say prophet again. All right, let's talk about Dan, uh, Daniel, Jonah the prophet. Jonah the prophet, okay? I'll say, so a prophet, verses 1 through 2, and we see, first of all, his call under that. Subpoint his call. Um, verse number 1, the Bible again says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. So we see his call. First of all, it was personal. His call was personal. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. It didn't come to anybody else. It came to Jonah. If God has something to say to you, uh, he, doesn't have to, he, he can use somebody else to say that to you. In this particular uh, part of the scripture here, we see that, that God's word came to Jonah. It was personal. The word of the Lord came to him. God's call came to Jonah personally. Not only did it come to him personally, it came to him very pointed. Uh, Jonah received specific instructions. Um, you know, we've talked about this before, about how God uh, speaks to his people and how he speaks to us. I mean, for us today, uh, you know, God doesn't speak to me in an audible voice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that God couldn't do that. God's very capable of doing that if that's what he wants to do. But I'm just telling you, God doesn't speak to me in that way. He speaks to me, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, we find that he spoke uh, through visions and dreams uh, he spoke through the Urim and the Thummim that the, um, the high priest would wear, you know, and then he spoke by casting lots and how the lot would fall. And here we're going to see in this story that the lot falls on Jonah in this passage. But God speaks to us today by his word through uh, circumstance, through, uh, you know, studies that we do, through, through other believers. He speaks to us in a variety of ways, but not audibly to me. Now, you know, some of you may say, well, God... You know, I'm very, I, I, the first flag that I hear when somebody says, well, God told me this. That's a flag for me. You know, again, I'm not doubting people. I'm not saying that God, you know, I'm not saying that God doesn't speak. I'm just saying that when, you know, people get up and say, well, you know, I'm just telling, I got a word from God today. Or I, I'm telling you this. You know, I have people come to me and say, listen, preacher, I got something to tell you. God told me to tell you this. I, it's just a flag for me, Okay. The prophet, his call was personal, his call was pointed. God gave Jonah specific instructions. Uh, he, he told him exactly what to do. God doesn't want us to be confused. He is not wanting that. God's not the author of confusion. He, does, he doesn't want us to be confused about his will and what he wants us to do in life, right? He wants us to know. He wants us to be uh, sure and, and know for sure what he is telling us to do. So Jonah is a prophet. God is speaking to him. He has, he's been given a message. God has called him and, and he's telling him what to do. So his call, personal, pointed, and then we see his cry. His cry, again, was personal. It says, go to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was, a, an Assyr it was the capital city of the Assyrians. Now, I want to read to you out of, from a, a commentary, uh, Matthew Henry, just a little bit of information about uh, Nineveh. It says here, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Uh, Nineveh was at, at this time the metropolis of the Assyrian monarchy, an eminent city, uh, a great city. That great city, 48 miles in, in compass. In other words, surround, around. It's, it's this humongous city all the way around. Uh, and it wasn't a circle. It was, if you study and read about it, it was, lo it was longer than it was uh, wide. But anyway, in its 
all the way around the structure of the city. It was at least 48 miles and probably more than that, more like 60. And it was great in the number of its inhabitants. Now the Bible says in here, uh, 120,000 in the latter part of chapter 4 um, of infants who didn't know their right from their left. So basically what that means is if there's that many um, infants in the city, then probably total number of population was anywhere from 600,000 to a million people in this city. It was a large city. It was a, a great city. And, and listen, it, 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 was a, it was a city where, that connected the east and the west. And they did all these trading and all these things happened. It was a great city. It was very important uh, in that time. It says here, great in wealth. Great in power and dominion. It was the city that for some time ruled over the kings of the earth. Listen to what he says. But great cities as well as great men are under God's government and judgment. Is that true? Yes. Great cities as well as a great men are under God's government and judgment. Nineveh was a great city and yet a heathen city. Without the knowledge and worship of the true God... How many great cities and great nations are there that sit in darkness and in the valley of the shadow of death? This great city was a wicked city. Their wickedness had come up before uh, God. Their wickedness was presumptuous, and they sinned with a high hand. It is sad to think what a great deal of sin is committed in great cities, where there are many sinners who are not only all sinners, but making one another sin. Their wickedness has come up that is, it has come to a high degree, to the highest pitch. The measure of it is full to the brim. Their wickedness has come up as that of Sodom. It has come up before me, God speaking to my face. So the word is, it is a bold and open affront to God. It is sinning against him in his sight. Therefore, Jonah must cry against it. He must witness against their great wickedness and must warn them of the destruction that was coming upon them for it. So... The cry that Jonah was supposed, he was supposed to go to Nineveh, again, that great city, that capital city of Assyria. Um, notice the word that is said there uh, in verse number two. It says again, arise. Everybody say arise. Now arise. This morning when I was um, at my son-in-law and my daughter's house, uh, my grandsons slept with me last night upstairs and I had to sleep right between them because they didn't want to sleep with each other because they kick each other. So instead they just kicked me all night, okay? Um, anyway, um, my grandsons were there and of course they, go to, they have to be at church at 8 o'clock. So I'm trying to help them get up, trying to help them get going this morning. And I'm talking to my oldest grandson, Rhett. I said, Rhett, you got to get up. Get up. Rhett, you got to get up. Rhett, you got to get up, dude. But he just laid there. He just laid there. And I said, you got to get up. See, God says to Jonah, you got to, 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 to go. Before you can go, you have to get up. You have to stand. The word rise there means to stand up, to establish yourself. So there are things that we have to do as God's people. When God tells us to do something, we have to arise first. We have to stand up. We have to establish ourselves. We have to do some things uh, to, to, before we get going. So God is telling Jonah, he said, you got, to, you got to stand up. You got to establish yourself. You got to get up uh, and get ready to go. The problem with most of us in our culture today, in the church culture and in our culture is, is uh, you know, we're not ready to get up. You know, why, why is, we read, Matthew Henry said that, that the sin of Nineveh was an affront to God. It, it, you know, God was basically, you know, if, if you're looking at a cup uh, full of sin, basically this cup is, is, is all the way to the top and it's running over, it's spilling over. And it's doing it right in front of God's face. It's, it's an affront to God. It is, it is almost like they are, they are raising their fist at God and saying, you know what, I, I'll do what I want to do. I'll live however I want to live. And who cares what you think, God? Now, I'm telling you, America... America, America today is going down that path. It really is. And I'm telling you, God, and we're going to see it. We talked about his grace and God's grace and God's mercy. 
He is extending that for a season to this country. And I'm telling you guys, we, we better, we better as God's people arise and we better give the message. We better tell those around us that Jesus is coming, that Jesus uh, is real, that they need Jesus in their heart, that they need Jesus in their life, that Jesus is the answer. His cry was personal. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Arise, stand up, establish yourself. Henry Blackby in his book, uh, he wrote, we cannot stay where we are and go with God. Experiencing God, his book, Experiencing God, he said, you can't stay where you're at and go with God. See, we can't, see, for most of us in our life, uh, we, need to rise, we need to rise and we need to go. The problem is, is we haven't, we haven't got up and established ourselves yet, so we're still laying in the bed, spiritually speaking, so we can't go. And if we're going to go with God, we can't stay where we're at. God is active. He is working. He is moving. And, God's, and, and the whole point of the Henry Blackwood book is, is joining God where he's at. Where, what's God doing? Where's God at work? And wherever God's at work, that's where we go to join him there. We don't, bring, we don't drag God over and say, okay, God, we got this going on. You come on over and join us. No, that's not how it works. What we do is we, we pray and we seek and we look to see where God is at work and we go join God where he is and we get on board with him. His cry is personal. Again, it's pointed. He didn't beat around the bush. I wrote this in the, out in the, he didn't beat around the bush. Um, my son-in-law said last night when he came in, he thanked me for watching the boys because my daughter and my wife and, and my other daughter, they're out of town. Anyway, he thanked me for watching the boys. He said, I'm sure you're not as hard on them as I am. He didn't beat around the bush. He knows that's the truth. He knows that I'm, I'm you know, probably softer than he is. You know, I'm, I'm more patient than he is. I probably let him get by with more than he does. But here in this, story, in this passage, God is telling Jonas, listen, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city, and I want you to cry against it. I want you to cry out against it. I want you to, to tell them. God's message was to the point with Jonah. It wasn't beat around the bush. It was simply saying, you know what, I want you to cry out against them. For their wickedness has come up before me, because Nineveh's sinfulness has not escaped me. In other words, Nineveh thinks that, they're just, that they can live however they want to, that they can just do whatever they want to do. Listen, we live in a world that thinks that too, that thinks they can just do whatever they want to do. They can sin as much as they want to, do whatever they want to do. They can live life to the fullest, whatever it looks like, and, and you know, there'll never be a consequence or anything for that. God is saying in this passage is there is, a, there is a time in the life of an individual, but more so in the life of a nation or a city, that I get enough. And this is it for Nineveh. God is saying, I've had enough. I've seen enough. It's come up before me. It's running over. It's, it's in, my, in my face. I can't, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. So I'm about to judge this city, this nation. No nation, great or small, escapes the eyes of Almighty God. No, not even the United States of America. God is calling the prophet Jonah to go and preach to the people of Nineveh. But we see the second point is this. Not only we see a prophet, we see a problem. Everybody say problem. Jonah is uh, a prophet of God. Jonah has, has preached and given God's message before. Here God comes to him and he says, listen, um, you know, I want you to get up and I want you to go and I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to give them this message that I'm telling you to do. The problem is, we see here in verse number three, it says, but Jonah, that word but, Jonah, but Jonah, God says go God says, crowd against the city of Nineveh because their wickedness has come up before me. And verse 3 says, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So the problem, there's a problem. Now, what is the problem with Jonah and with Nineveh? 
See, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were a very cruel people. And they were very cruel to God's people. They were very cruel to Israel. And so Jonah does not like the Assyrians. He does not want Nineveh to find God's grace and mercy. You realize that in this country we live in, that there are people, and, and there's even Christian people, that really don't want God to extend His mercy and grace to certain people. You know, do you realize, and, and you know this, we've said it a thousand times, you know that God hates sin, but He loves the sinner, right? He does. Over and over again in the Bible. I was listening to a preacher uh, yesterday. And he was talking about how God, um, how much God loves people. How much he loves individuals. And when it, like, like the story I was listening to this morning, they were coming in and we were talking about the, the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and how Jesus was, was uh, remember he was drawing in the, on the ground and, and then you know, he looked up and all her accusers were gone and all this kind of stuff. And you know, basically Jesus says, well, where's your accusers? She says, well, they've all left. And he says, well, I don't accuse you either. Neither do I accuse you. See, God, that's who, that's who Jesus is. He offers grace and mercy. And, 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 you know, that's who we have to be. I'm telling you, I get so sick and tired of the, the, the junk and the stuff that goes on that's said and heard about uh, in our country. You know, the, the affront that people have to God, the affront that people have to God's church, the affront to pe that, that people have to, to Christians in this country that we thought would never happen and would never come here. But it's here. It's reality. Jonah does not like the people of Nineveh. He, he does not like them. He, he doesn't like them because they've been, that's, that, you know, that, country that that group of people has been terrible to God's people and to his people and he's seen that for year upon year upon year upon year upon year he resists the call of God the Bible says he arose and to flee to Tarshish see Tarshish uh, you might think well you know Jonah just took a detour no 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 the Bible, Tarshish is 2,000 miles in the other direction Jonah not only he, he just you know he's saying you know what I'm not doing this I don't like them and I really, don't, I really don't want you to give them mercy and grace. And, and, you know, I don't want to go and preach to them and try to get them to repent. Because basically I know if I go and preach to them, it's what you want me to do. They're going to repent and they're going to turn back to you. And they're going to receive this grace and mercy that I receive. And I don't want them to have it. Two thousand miles in the opposite direction of Nineveh. The Bible says he bought himself a ticket, boarded the ship, and he went down in the ship. Not only did he resist God's call, but he removes himself from God's presence, the Bible says there. To flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah thought he could actually remove himself from the very presence of God if he got far enough away. Now Jonah probably knew actually that God would know where he was. But he thought he could get far enough away that where God couldn't really get after him about not preaching to the Ninevites. Some of us today are trying to get away from God. We're trying to do anything but, you know, do what he says. Obey. You know, get involved in church. Serve. Live for him. See, Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. And he resists God's call by removing himself from the situation. Again, why is Jonah running instead of obeying God's call? Well, again, he's done that. He's, he's given God's message before, but he doesn't like Nineveh. He doesn't want them to be saved and want them to repent. He wants them to be, basically wants them to be destroyed. He wants them to be destroyed. So basically, Jonah sees Nineveh as an enemy. So God's wanting Jonah to go to the enemy and tell them, 
that he loves them and if they'll turn away from their sin, he'll forgive them if they'll repent. Who is God calling me or you to go to? Is that the call of the missionary? The story of Jim Elliott um, goes out of, out of our country to another culture. You know, he's killed by the, the natives. You know, we know the story. Call to go to our enemies. We're called to go wherever God asks us to go. We're called to go to tell everybody about Jesus, not just some people, not the people that we like, not the people that are like us. I'm telling you, our country is so divided. And if we're not careful, the division of politics and culture will keep us from loving people the way that we should. I believe in my heart and I'm not telling you I got it going on. I'm telling you I struggle with those things too. But I'm just telling you this, that I believe when the Lord saves me and he makes me a new person, uh, he gives me his eyes. And my eyes see people differently than my old human eyes. My eyes, my human eyes see people and judge them. But my, my supernatural eyes that God gives me, it helps me to look at them through God's eyes. And I see them as someone who needs to hear about the Lord Jesus somebody who needs salvation, somebody who I, I should want to spend eternity with me in heaven, somebody that I know needs to be saved. See, Jonah had a problem. He had a problem. God's calling him to be a missionary. He's a prophet, but he doesn't like the people. He didn't want to see them be saved. He didn't want to see them have any mercy or grace. Listen, don't get caught up in our culture right now. Don't get caught up in the, in the politics and the things that are going on. I'm not saying we shouldn't be involved and we shouldn't vote. I'm not saying any of that stuff. What I'm saying is this. Don't allow the lies that Satan is telling to cause you to see people uh, through the eyes of, again, politics or ideology or any of those things. We better see people through Jesus' eyes. We better realize that everybody we come in contact with every day needs to know about Jesus. We need to be missionaries. We need to be missionaries. So we've seen a prophet. And then we see a problem. And Jonah's problem again is that he doesn't like the Ninevites. He doesn't like them because they have brought hurt on his people. So Jonah has decided to, to totally disobey God's call. With no thoughts of the judgment of the Ninevites or God's reaction to his disobedience. He's in the lower parts of the ship. We find in verse number five that he is fast asleep. Let's bow our heads just for a moment. You know, today as we think about just this message, it's very familiar. This story of Jonah and the, and the big fish or the whale, whatever you want to say. As we think about that and as we... As we um, this message and the Word of God, it's why we know it's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it, it's right where we are. It meets us right where we are in culture today. America. America needs revival. America needs to repent. America needs to turn away from their sin. And God has called us here for such a time as this to be His mouthpiece, to be the one to tell his word, to be the one to, to shout it from the rooftop, rooftops, to arise and to go and to tell, to cry out against sin and to tell them about a Savior. Father, I pray today as we come to this time of decision, Lord, I confess to you that, Lord, I, I, I'm no different from anyone else. I struggle. I struggle with our culture today. Lord, I, I struggle with, with your people who have different ideologies, people who, who Lord, uh, have different views of things. God, people who, uh, Lord, are just anti-you, anti-church, anti-Christian. 
And Lord, I, I pray today that God, as, as we hear the message of Jonah and we hear about the prophet who, uh, Lord, who, uh, who loved you and who was called by you, but God who refused to be obedient to you because he didn't like the people. He didn't want them to have grace. He didn't want them to have mercy. He wanted them to have judgment. Lord, that's not who you've called us to be. You've called us to love people, to minister to people, to tell them about your, your mercy and grace and your love. Lord, I pray that as we, as we study through this book, as we think about your grace and mercy and how you extend it to all people, God, I pray you would help us to, to Lord, to think of people, even, even to, Lord, as we hear the news and as we see people, God, as maybe as we hear people just even that we come in contact with, God, who, who um, are anti-you and anti-Christ and anti-church. Uh, Lord, help us to love them in spite of them. And Lord, to tell them of the good news, the love that you have for them and how you've saved us and redeemed us and forgiven us. Help us to be those missionaries you've called us to be. Lord, I pray for this time of decision, God, that, that we would be obedient to you. And God, that, that we think about this story, this story is not just another fishing story. It's a story about a prophet. It's a story about a city. It's a story about a God who worked in the midst of both of those and brought forgiveness and grace to both of those. Lord, I pray your blessings, God, your will to be done in this time of decision. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Stand.